Well, good morning, everybody. Out here today, it's a beautiful morning after kind of a long week, and I know all you, all of y'all are, some of you are still up in the, up in the snow trying to get out, <laughs> trying to dig out, and it's been rough up the hill. Beautiful day down here today in uh, Knights Ferry, with the Knights Ferry Bridge in the background. Historical place. Wildflowers will be coming on here in a couple months here. So we uh, are going to be picking it up in John chapter 21 today. Almost done with this book. Almost done with this chapter, the whole book. Uh, we're going we're gonna to put a bow on it probably next week. How exciting. So let's pray and we'll see what, uh, see what the Lord has for us this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the day, for uh, bringing us here, for giving us an avenue to, to do church, even amidst the COVID weirdness, and uh, just for showing up where we do. Lord, and we uh, are just thankful for your presence, thankful for your Holy Spirit, uh, your word. Just pray that you would teach us today, show us something that we need, and uh, we give you all the thanks and all the glory. Lord, just build us up into what you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So uh, last week, we saw that the disciples had gone fishing. Peter declared a fishing trip, and so they, they went out, they went fishing, and uh, they were not catching. They got skunked. Uh, guy from the shore, who we're told was Jesus, gave him some pretty absurd advice. He's like, well, take the net from the left side of the boat, throw it over on the right side of the boat, and you'll catch some fish. That's crazy, because the fish don't know which side's which, you know, or they all clumped up on here, you know, waiting for the net to come to them. Apparently they were. It's crazy advice, because it worked. Uh, all of a sudden there was like more fish than they could haul. They could not pull the net into the boat at that point. It worked and that was kind of a repeat miracle we brought up. And uh, we're gearing up, we're paving the way for the restoration of Peter. Peter is going to be reinstated. And Jesus is leading us into this uh, event by calling some key points to remembrance. And he does this in the presence and actually for all the disciples present. You know, it's notable that, that they actually received Thomas back into their fellowship after his, uh, we were talking about that a couple weeks ago, after his incident of doubt, his declaration of, I'll believe it when I can put my finger through his hand and when I can stick my hand up into his body cavity where the spear cut him open. That's, you know, a bit of, bit of skepticism on the part of Thomas. And after that, the week after, they received Thomas back into their fellowship. They, uh, us in airplanes, I tell you what. So they, they took Thomas back into the fellowship and then Jesus showed up and he was like, I heard you, Thomas. Here, put your hand up in here. Ew. And you know, be, be careful what you ask for sometimes. Be careful when you ask for snow. Because, <laughs> yeah, look at what happened. So it's notable they received Thomas back into their fellowship. They're even still hanging around with Peter after his, you know, great incident of denial, not once, not twice, but three times in a row, just like Jesus said would happen. And Peter said, I would never, I would never. And sure enough, he does all three times before the rooster crows. And they're still hanging around with Peter. So these guys are still kind of clinging together and that's good. They hadn't gotten to the point where like your sin bothers me more than my sin so you know I'm gonna like separate fellowship from you uh, they're still all clinging together they're hanging around together they're leaning on each other and that's good and Jesus is about to make the Peter thing quite official uh, it's coming up next week uh, he's gonna make that restoration public in front of all the guys and you know Peter's probably in limbo right now he's like am I am I discounted am I out am I like I know I'm pulled off the, you know, he probably felt pulled off the field of play and he was benched. He's like, am I even on the team anymore? You know, Peter was probably wondering. He didn't know where he stood. Jesus is going to let him know where he stands, but he doesn't just come out and do it right away. He's like retracing these stories, these miracles, these events uh, as a reminder for Peter and the guys. So we're going to pick it up today. We'll backtrack a little bit uh, about a verse. Start in John chapter 21, verse 6, where Jesus said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, 
and you will find some fish. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. And we mentioned they were about a football field away. That's where it says it. We didn't get there last week. You're probably wondering, well, how did they know that? Well, this is where it says it. They're about a, about a football field out from shore. So... John, after this event with the fish, is like, wow. He, he says, it is the Lord. He connected the dots. It's like, wow, I've kind, of, I've kind of seen this story before where, you know, we were out getting skunked and all of a sudden we caught a whole bunch of fish. It was because Jesus was there. I've seen this before. And it, it clicks in John's head. He's like, it is the Lord. And just like at the tomb, John recognized what was going on, and you know he, he doesn't know what to do with it once he recognizes what's going on. And Peter is going to rush right in and do what Peter does. He's not going to hesitate. Uh, so you remember back at the tomb, but they took off running when it was announced that the tomb was empty. And they got to the tomb. John was younger, faster, got there first, and stops. And you know he's looking inside, but he won't go in the tomb. And Peter shows up and boom, barrels right in because that's what that's the way Peter is. Same thing here. It's like John kind of recognizes it, and Peter's like, "Well, well, heck, I'm going to where Jesus is." And so he just like girds up, jumps in the water, and uh, starts swimming toward him. It's like Peter suspected it, but he was kind of waiting for confirmation. I'm sure they're all like, "Man, I've seen this story before. This is like." very similar to that miracle like years ago when Jesus first showed up with us and and you know we were getting skunked and he provided a lot of fish is it him is it him Peter's like I'm sure he, he suspected it but he was waiting for that confirmation and it came from John and he went you know nobody wants to be the first one to raise their hand in class nobody wants to be the first one to pipe up in a meeting you, know, you always wait for somebody else and as soon as as soon as John like raised his hand and said something, Peter's like, I am out. His response was, man, I, I'm out of here. He wrapped his outer garment around him and jumped in the water. Now, why was his outer garment off? That sounds kind of weird. Uh, he was probably, I don't know if you, you know, they're working out there. They're fishing. It's hard work, uh, you know, like dragging and manipulating the net and the boat. And, and uh, sometimes when you're working hard, you see construction guys running around shirtless sometimes because they get hot and that's, you know, that's kind of how they work. He was stripped down for work. Wasn't totally naked. That would just be weird. <laughs> they were out in the boat and Peter's like, what, what, what are you doing? You know, that, that would have just made it weird. So he's probably stripped down for work, got his outer garment and put it back on. And uh, the reason he did that is in that culture, there was a propriety that was there. Uh, you, didn't <clears throat> you didn't appear before a superior like your rabbi in a state of undress. And so it was, you know, Jesus was his leader, his rabbi, so he's gonna put his outer clothes back on and do things the right way. I think we could use a little bit of that these days. Uh, people run around in a state of undress sometimes when they shouldn't. We've, we've got a, a saying in our house, there comes a time in every man's life when it's time just to keep your shirt on. And you know, I've, I've reached that point, and uh, I'll tell you what, I'll keep my shirt on if you all keep yours on. That's, that's no, not a bad thing. Uh, but that's what it was, was that, you know, it was, it was a, improper to show up to your leader, your rabbi, in a state of undress. So Peter is, you know, just trying to stick with that propriety. And he must have been used to being in the water by now. Remember the one time where it was just like, you know, Jesus comes to him on the water and he's like, if it's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus is like, come on out. And he gets out, he takes a couple steps, he's good on the water at first, and then he realizes what he's doing, he gets a little scared, and he starts to sink into the water. Peter must have been used to being in the water by now. And at this point, he didn't care. Uh, I wonder, though, if in the back of his head, it's like, if that's Jesus, I wonder if I'll stay on the water this time. I wonder if that was like playing in the back. Maybe this will be the time it works. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what was going on in his head, but I think it would have been hilarious if this was the time it did work and he was like cannonballing or diving into the water and didn't go into the water. I think that would have been hilarious. 
that and plus you know it sure would have made the upcoming conversation with peter more impressive if peter would have like at that point walked out upon the water and gone to the shore with jesus it would have like been very impressive uh but jesus isn't into the outwardly impressive uh he knows that you don't get the fruit without the root so that would have been like an impressive thing that everybody would have remembered um you know but Peter, uh, Jesus wasn't into doing the things the impressive way for people. He knows you don't get the fruit without the root. Here in the world, we sometimes try to fake the fruit. We try and fake the outward appearance, the outward development, without the struggle of the underground work. Uh, when we were out on the trail, there was a section where they had uh, a wind event in 2011. I, I expect it happened again. I think it was very similar, this mono wind event where the wind comes in really strong from a direction it usually doesn't. And we were out there and it, there were still some trees standing, but there were like a crazy amount of trees that were just like uprooted and fallen over. And it looked like somebody just dumped a bunch of matchsticks out there. Only these were not matchsticks. These were big trees that were, you know, probably 30, 40, inches diameter uh, they were giant I have pictures of us standing in front of the roots where they just like pulled right up out of the ground and I came up like half of where the roots broke you know on the, the bottom of the tree it was just crazy and you know the roots I bet the trees were up there and they're swinging in that wind going man I wish my roots were a little deeper right now I'm a nice tall tree but I don't boom you know and they fall over so you can't have the fruit without the root. The root system is very important. And Jesus is more interested in the deeper change than the outward appearance. And a lot of us are, you know, people might look at us and think, man, that's not a really super spiritual person as I think of super spiritual people and the way they should look. Uh, but what you look like doesn't really matter. Jesus is interested in the root system. He's interested in going deeper. And so he doesn't make this impressive you know, miracle where now he allows Peter to walk on the water. Peter just like, Peter don't care. He's just jumping in. And uh, he did not hesitate. He jumped in, he started swimming. Peter just wanted to get to where Jesus was. And I admire him for that. You know, the other guys were content to row the boat and tow their catch, which was good because they needed those fish. You know, that was, that was why they were out there in the first place. Peter kind of forgot why he was out there to begin with. When he realized and he got the confirmation the man that was actually jesus on the shore he became singularly focused on getting to where jesus was and peter's like jesus yeah splash cannonball i'm out of here and he starts swimming for the shore just to be where jesus is i love that love that about him verse nine when they landed they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread Jesus said to them bring some of the fish you have just caught so that should ring some bells uh, they show up at the shore there's a fire with coals and fish on it and you know the last time Peter was around Jesus with a warm fire of coals I'm, I'm sure that was playing in his head uh, that you know, last time it didn't go so well, and I'm sure that just like dredged up uh, the feelings of failure, maybe the feelings of guilt, and you know, just like brought to the surface everything that he was feeling and struggling with at this point in his walk. So it should ring some bells. And again, Jesus is retracing some of the events of the past. Though much had changed, right? He had, he had died, gone to the grave, come out of the grave, victorious and resurrected though much had changed his love for his guys had not changed so there was the fire and that should have rung some bells with peter you know and and not happy bells either you know it's like dredging up those things that, that need to be dealt with and sometimes we need to deal with things that are uncomfortable there was the fish and the bread uh and that that kind of reminds me of a time when five thousand people were fed with fish and bread there was a gathering to share a meal. And you know, the Last Supper, they had just done that. They sat down, they shared a meal. And there's all that meant that, that 
Jesus, you know, in spite of these guys, the skepticism, the denial, they're, they're tim you know, just being timid and hiding out. Jesus wants to share a meal with them. And remember to share a meal in that culture was to have communion with people. You were, by sitting down at a meal together, you're like, I am of you and you are of me. And we share this with each other and we share each other's lives. And, you know, Jesus still wanted to do that with them. So they find that Jesus, having faced down death and now victorious in resurrection, is still setting the tone by serving them. Now more than ever, after Jesus was resurrected, I think he could have demanded to be served. He's like, dudes, I died. I overcame death. Is there nothing I cannot do? Y'all should come around and serve me. You know, bow down, serve me. But he didn't do that. He could have. He had every right to. But instead, he continues to serve them, which just underscores what he told them after he washed their feet. Remember back in John chapter 13, verse 15, you washed their feet, and he said, I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. And he is still doing to them. He's still doing for them. So where did the fish come from? Jesus had fish already. I was wondering, you know, thinking about that. Where did the fish come from? Did, did uh, Jesus catch them? I don't know. You know, well, the guys were out toiling in their own strength. Jesus was providing fish in his. Uh, did Jesus... Yeah, he must have gotten there early. He was there before them. Did he catch them? Did he just like, I need fish, and have fish miraculously show up and appear on the grill? Did, you know, he like call the fish, and they like flopped up and like flopped on the grill? I don't know. Doesn't really matter. The point is, is that all the fish are his to begin with. And so Jesus says, you know, he, Jesus provided fish for himself. Jesus provided fish for the guys. All the fish are his. And so he says, bring some of the fish you have just caught. You know, he didn't need their fish, which he actually provided for them as well. But he invited them to contribute some of what they had, some of what he provided for them. And that reminds me of John chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Uh, and what had happened here is that uh, they're out there, Jesus is teaching, and people is getting late, they're getting hungry, and Jesus is like, well, let's feed people. And they're like, well, we don't have anything. And... So Jesus is like, what do you have? And Andrew spoke up, starting verse 9, in objection. He said, there's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. So remember about that, that Jesus takes our scarcity and he turns that into abundance. And he invites us to contribute. He didn't need the little guys, you know, we talked about how that was kind of kind of like ketchup packets and, uh, and saltine crackers. It was like condiments, you know, this was not supposed to be a full meal. It was a snack. And, uh, but Jesus invited him to bring his snack and then Jesus provided the abundance. So that kind of that kind of reminds me of that. So you see Jesus kind of retracing these events and these stories in ways that are kind of familiar, that are bringing all this stuff up to the surface before he reinstates Peter. Verse 11. So Simon Peter, after Jesus called for some of the fish, climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. At least that John was eyewitness to. So, Jesus is like, Bring me some of the fish you guys caught. And so Peter's like, Okay. And he, you know, goes and grabs the net and drags it ashore. Uh, full of large fish, 153 to be exact. One of my commentaries said that could have been about 300 pounds worth of fish. Peter's a beast. I just want to point that out. John was faster. Peter was a strong beast. Uh, 
and that net then was easier to manage with his feet on the ground than rather than trying to balance in the boat and easier to manage when he was doing what Jesus asked him to do. When Jesus asks, he's like, I'm doing. And he goes and he grabs that net and he brings it in. 153 fish. That's kind of weird. That's a, you know, a very exact number. Uh, why 153? And there's all kinds of theories on this. Check this out. You start getting into these number games. I, I want to warn you against that. Okay, it's fun. Numbers mean things in the Bible. But uh, you can get carried away with like chasing down these numbers and what they mean. St. Augustine thought it was the sum of the numbers from 1 to 17. You add up the numbers from 1 to 17, it comes out to 153. 17 is the number of commandments plus, like 10 commandments, plus the sevenfold gifts of the Spirit. That sounds a little far-fetched to me. Uh, I don't know. Some ancient writers speculated that there were 153 known types of fish in their world. Uh, at that time, and that re represented a complete harvest of mankind. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, what we do know for sure is that there were 153 fish, because it tells us that. So we're just we're not going to get overly carried away and speculating on what that means. There were 153 fish. It means that they accounted for their catch, which is good business. So they, they counted them, they knew what they had, and they you know, presumably ate some of them and took the rest to market. They knew how much they had caught. Uh, I've got a good theory, too, on this, the 153, that I am 54 years old, and the Lord knew that I would be teaching this today. And 53 is, you know, 54 is 53 plus 1, so it's like, you know, 53 plus 1, which is, I hear the Lord... God of Israel is one, you know. No, I'm not, I'm not even going there. I've, we know there were 153 fish. They counted them. It's good business. And we know the net held so that none were lost. And then it says that none of the disciples asked who he was. They didn't recognize him from the boat. That was, we talked last week about how that was a little easier because it was super early in the morning. The sun was just coming up. It's hard to see detail, you know, especially from 300 feet away. Uh, it was easier to know or understand that they didn't recognize him then. Now they're up close with him. They still don't really recognize him with their eyeballs when they're looking at him. They can't recognize him by sight. This is a little more troubling. Why didn't they recognize him? And uh, some people speculate that he was still bearing the wounds of being beaten beyond recognition. That he was still, you know, puffy. And, if, you know, sometimes when people get beat up real bad, you can't really recognize them as who they are at first, and that's a possibility. He retained those scars. He still had the, still had the holes, and he still had the hole in his, in his abdomen that you know where they like stuck the spear up. Uh, so that's a possibility. And some people think that he was able to withhold being recognized until he wanted to be recognized. And you know, there's several events where it talks about Jesus being with people where they didn't recognize him until such time as he wanted to be recognized. So I, I don't know. What do we do know? We do know that they couldn't recognize him by sight right away. But they sure knew who he was by what he said and what he did. And that's an important object lesson for us. You know, sometimes we lose sight of Jesus. Sometimes he shows up in ways that we don't understand, that we don't recognize, but we sure recognize him by who he is and what he does in our lives. So we're going to put a bow on it today. I think we're probably running a little short, but I wanted to save next week. I want to do that all in one shot. Uh, so what do we do with this today? I think Jesus doesn't want us to forget our seasons of failure. Thomas had them. Uh, the sons of thunder, James and John, had their, their like really kind of gross moments uh, in ministry. Uh, Peter, obviously feeling on the bench, not even sure if he's on the team anymore. Uh, and Jesus starts retracing these things, and he's bringing these things back into view, back into the, back to the surface. And he could have just been, you know, just not even talked about it, and just reinstated Peter without saying anything. But he doesn't want us to forget our seasons of failure. He doesn't want us to forget them, but he doesn't want us to continue to live there either. We don't live in our failures. They happen. We should remember them. We should understand them. We should work through them. 
Uh, Richard Rohr said you should never put a sin behind you until you learn what it has to teach you, or else you're going to, you know, you're doomed to repeat it. Don't forget your seasons of failure, but Jesus doesn't want us to live there. We don't live in our seasons of failure. And we bring our seasons of failure to him, he won't hold them to our account anymore. He wasn't holding Peter in judgment. Peter didn't like roll up on the shore and Jesus didn't bap him in the head and go cook your own fish. You're in trouble, mister. No, he didn't do that. He wasn't holding Peter in judgment. He had nothing but love and grace. He continued to seek to, to serve that meal. Come and eat. Come, be one with me. Be one with each other. Let us belong to each other by sharing a meal together. And, you know, serving them by providing a, a barbecue breakfast on the beach. So he wasn't, he wasn't holding Peter in judgment. We need to retain those parts of our story. And I'm glad, you know, that they didn't, Peter didn't get reinstated and they just like wrote all that out of the story. You know, like sometimes people do. It's like, oh, it never happened. We're just not going to talk about it anymore. We need to retain those parts of our story to keep us from repeating our failures, to keep us humble, remembering where we come from, uh, so we don't get all high and mighty and start looking down on other people that are where we used to be, that are walking the road that we used to walk, uh, to keep us humble, and to help set other people free by telling our stories. You know, I'm sure Peter got to tell that story a lot, and, and uh, old Doubting Thomas, it's like, dude, I'm the, I was a skeptic. This is what happened, you know, and this is what Jesus did. By telling the story, you set people free. By telling the story, you set yourself free. Another thing we should take away today is that sometimes Jesus shows up in ways we don't recognize him. Sometimes he shows up in the form of difficult people. Sometimes he shows up in the form of difficult circumstances, and he's using that to get through to us, and we don't recognize what he's doing until we start seeing, hearing his voice, hearing what he says and what he does. So we don't have to recognize him by sight, we just got to recognize him by who he is and what he does, to know his character and to recognize what he's doing in that. Number three, I am chomping at the bit to get to next week's message. I have been since we started. I was hoping to do it all in one shot. I just want to get to that. This is so important to me. But we need to see that Jesus didn't go there right away either. Jesus took his time getting there. He, they went fishing. So they might have been waiting for him. We talked about how he might have been showing up a little late for Peter's liking. They went fishing. He let them go. He let them get skunked. He provided the fish. And now He's provided them breakfast and he's retracing these miracles, these events, these things that show us, you know, bring all these things back into the into view and into focus. So he didn't go there right away. And we're not going there right away. So we're just going to let those things kind of resonate, you know, to look at those things and let those remind us as well. Jesus is subtly calling things to memory. His miracles, the failures of the guys, the successes of the guys. Uh, stories that define who he is, who he is to them, who he is to us. He's like subtly calling these things to memory right now. And it's going to make next week's just much more meaningful. Meaningful to us, as I'm sure it was for Peter and the other guys that were there. So, if you're feeling benched, if you're not sure you're on the team anymore, hang in there. Just look at this as Jesus brings his character to the surface again, as he's not judging them, not smacking them, but serving them and loving them. Uh, at this point, when he could demand to be served more than ever, he's serving them. And as he's doing these subtle things and painting these little pictures, next week's coming. So if you feel like you're off the team, don't count yourself out yet. Uh, hang around. Next week, the one I've been chomping at the bit to get. Lord, we thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what, uh, the, just the way, the gracious way that you dealt with these guys. That you didn't just walk in and forget the past necessarily and reinstate Peter. That you didn't walk in and judge Peter and beat him on the head. That you walked in with grace 
and service, continuing to set the example for how they should be with each other and how they should be with other people. That you lovingly stepped in and recalled stories, recalled events, recalled miracles for them to set that tone before restoring Peter, putting him back on the field. And uh, Lord, we just pray that we would take that away today, no matter where we're at, uh, good times, bad times, that this would speak to us today and that we come back next week and be spoken to again as we see this uh, all kind of funnel down into this one event. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, for bringing us here, for having us all be able to be together uh, virtually, if not physically. And uh, speak to us, Lord, today and through the week. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.